gather around as we spill the tea on cybersecurity. We're talking about the topic in a way that everyone can understand. I'm your host, Jarrah Rowe, giving you just what you need. This is the Tea on Cybersecurity, a podcast from Trava. Welcome to episode one of the Tea on Cybersecurity. During this episode, we are getting down to the bottom of what cybersecurity actually is. I cannot wait to learn about this topic more with our listeners. I have a very special guest that will help shine some light on this industry and why it is important. But most importantly, they will be helping us answer what is cybersecurity anyway. I would like to welcome Jim Goldman, the CEO and co-founder of Trava. Jim, thanks for joining me. Well, you're so welcome, Jara. I am happy to be here. So that all of the listeners know more about you and your experience in the cybersecurity industry, can you go through your background for us? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I like to sometimes say that I've been in cybersecurity as long as there's been a thing called cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, the truth is, we actually called it network security when I started in this. My introduction to this field was I took a professorship at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, and started their network engineering degree program. And then pretty early on, we started worrying about the security of the network, in particular the internet at that time, which was research-based only. It wasn't open to the public yet. Mm -hmm. And then that led to work in curriculum and lab development in cyber forensics. And then um, I started doing some research on reverse engineering malware when that became a thing. And that's when the FBI came to see me and asked me to get a top secret security clearance, which I did. And I went to work for the FBI for five years as a task force officer on the FBI Cybercrime Task Force, where I served as lead cyber investigator on both criminal and national security cyber squads. And then after 20 years at Purdue, I wanted to get back to industry. So I joined a, a SaaS-based B2C digital marketing company here in Indianapolis named Exact Target. Mm -hmm. Became their first CISO, got them ISO certified. And then in 2013, Exact Target was acquired by Salesforce and became the Salesforce Marketing Cloud. So I was CISO of the Marketing Cloud for quite some time. That grew from one company to six companies. And then Salesforce asked me to build out a consistent security governance, risk management, and compliance organization across all of Salesforce because Salesforce had grown by acquisition. And so there was a lot of disparate security organizations. So we brought that all under one umbrella. I did that until December, 2019, and we pretty much started Trava right after that. So impressive. So very impressive. Thank so you. You're welcome. So listeners, I'm pretty sure that was a lot of terminology that you may be unfamiliar with, but if you continue to listen to the T on cybersecurity, we will answer more of those questions and help define some of those definitions. So Jim, when you first started talking, you talked about that it was network security before it became cybersecurity. Can you talk more about what potentially may have happened to make the name shift? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the word cybersecurity, obviously it's made up of two words, right? Cyber and security. And so the reason why cybersecurity is so broad now, basically it says anything that has a computer chip in it is potentially in that realm of cybersecurity. And mm. if it not only has a computer chip in it, but it's somehow networked, either by Wi-Fi or some other connection, then it's definitely falls into that world of cybersecurity. So literally your kitchen appliances fall into that realm and mm -hmm. fall into the world of cybersecurity. Your personal devices like your phone fall into the realm of cybersecurity. Your ring doorbells fall into the world of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Your security cameras fall into the world of cybersecurity. Anything that has computer chips in it, processing controllers in a manufacturing environment, in an electrical production plant, in a sewage treatment plant, all of those computer-driven devices, sometimes it's called 
Internet of Things, IoT devices. Mm -hmm. They're all in this ecosystem of cybersecurity. It might be quicker to list things that aren't <laughs> cybersecurity <laughs> than that are these days, right? Like you yes. know, automobiles, right? Automobiles mm -hmm. are full of computer chips and now, especially the electric vehicles, they just get software updates automatically. That's cybersecurity. Yeah, the, one of the things that I learn more and more as I read different cybersecurity content is that we all deal with things that fall under cybersecurity every day, but it's just not a common term to like the everyday person to really Correct. grasp what we're all like exposed to all of the time. Correct. Correct. So I feel like you were already answering this question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it again. What is the actual definition of cybersecurity? Yeah, so, you know, to be as concise as possible, it is the effort to secure any cyber-based product or process. That's really my definition of it. I find that easy to understand, but can you explain it to me as if you were explaining it to one of your grandchildren? <laughs> well... <laughs> My grandchildren are probably more cybersecurity. I mean, when I have a question about my phone, I ask my grandchildren. Oh, they're, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one of your gr grandchildren's friend or something, yeah. like a kid. How would you explain it to them? So really, it comes down to take the cyber thing away, right? Mm -hmm. Just talk in terms of, okay, what are we trying to protect? And very often I talk about an analogy of a jewelry store or something like this. Mm -hmm. In this case, asset that we're really trying to protect, it's not the cyber device. It's not the laptop. It's not the phone. It's the data that one can get to through mm -hmm. that. So we have to look at the computer or the phone is almost like an unlocked door. Go back to like, physical crime, burglary, that kind of thing. They wanted to break into a brick and mortar store. What would they do? They would look for an unlocked door. And so what we're saying is when you have an electronic device, be it a phone, be it a ring camera, be it a laptop, what have you, you have to look at that as a potentially unlocked door into the true asset, the true thing you're really trying to protect. And that's your personal data, your financial data, if you're a working person, the data of the company that you work for, the data of the of your customers. That mm -hmm. Awesome. I definitely understand that with the analogy of a burglar trying to get into the door to get the goods. I right. totally, that totally it's makes sense, but I understand that. Same, yeah. It's the same thing, except it's an electronic door mm -hmm. and electronic goods. Awesome. Listeners, I hope that that analogy worked for you all as well. So, Jim, now I would like to switch gears just a little bit to talk about more of the history of cybersecurity. So can you talk to me about like the first cyber crime? Sure. So I think there, I think there, there, there could be a lot of debate. But what I'd like to talk about is the mm -hmm. first wake up call cyber crime, the, the most publicized one. And that happened on uh, November 2nd, 1988. So it, it was related to the internet. But as I alluded to before, the internet at that time was not open to the general public. It was a research network that connected research universities. And so what happened was a person who was a student at the time named Robert Morris, and this incident is sometimes referred to as the Morris Worm uh, okay. wrote a program that actually spread and self-propagated. Now, it, some would say well, that really wasn't criminal activity because nothing was stolen, et cetera. But basically it brought the internet to its knees, you know, research, mm -hmm. research and military organizations and um, secret laboratories were on the internet at that time too. So these research laboratories, military, et cetera, was severely limited as well. And what happened is, it, because it's self-propagated, it quickly took over. And what it did was it took over the processing power of all the computers that were connected to the internet. Wow. Um, uh, ironically, it was a colleague of mine at Purdue, Eugene Spafford, 
that actually figured out what it was, how it worked, and how to stop it. So that's a cool fact as well. But that that was the, an article was published in the New York Times about it, mm-hmm. and so it really was the first. Oh my gosh, you know, this is really scary stuff. There is such. A, we had been trying to sound the alarm and saying, "Hey, yeah. it was tough to get people to listen to us." But the Morris worm really got everybody's attention. Wow. So today, cyber criminals had a great example of how to to get in and keep growing, it seems. So like I mentioned, today's cyber criminals, are they're only getting smarter. You were giving a couple examples earlier, but what are some ways we can all make sure we are safe and secure? One thing that I've learned recently is the importance of updating software. I must admit that I'm a person that doesn't do it immediately. I typically wait until it's like, you need to update this now, but I know that is not good. So what are some ways that people in their everyday lives could make sure to do to keep their data safe and secure? Yeah, so certainly updating software is a big one. If you have a laptop, it has a thing called an operating system. And Mm -hmm. chances are you're getting messages if your operating system hasn't been updated. We use the word patched, right? Hasn't Mm -hmm. been patched. And so you're absolutely right. Take the time to patch your operating system. Because what happens as each new vulnerability that can attack the operating system comes out, right? That's only Mm -hmm. what we call attack vector. There are others. But as each new attack on an operating system comes out, the vendors of those operating systems will provide patches. And so, yeah, that's kind of a one step behind catch up game, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You really should do it. The other thing that's really simple, but not necessarily easy. And there's a difference between the two is you have to change your passwords. I know people have probably heard this a hundred times and they shake their say head. Yes. And they say, yeah, but everybody's got a yeah, but yeah, but they're so difficult to remember, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. And so keep it simple and, you you know, um, use like your dog's name or hopefully Mm -hmm. you're still not using a password that's literally password. But you, and you certainly don't want to use the same password in multiple places, but it's that kind of thing. Now, how do you go about that? Well, there are things called password managers Mm -hmm. that make it easier, password lockers. The other thing to do is, you want to make your passwords complex and long and people say, well, I don't know how to do that. And the easy way to do that is to use what we call a passphrase, pick a sentence that's meaningful to you, and then just take the first letter of each word in that sentence and that becomes your password. And yeah. then maybe you change the suffix on it from time to time as it needs to change. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a password that could be looked up in the dictionary because the, mm-hmm. the, the cyber criminals will do what's called a dictionary attack. Wow. The other thing related to passwords and authentication, that's, again, not that difficult, not that expensive, but enormously effective is what's called multi-factor authentication. Mm-hmm. So on your laptop, have it be that you don't just need a password, but you need to touch your finger on the fingerprint ID if that's available, or you have a device where you need to get a a code off your cell phone, as well as type in the password. Anytime you have more than one thing that Mm -hmm. has to go in, that's called multi-factor authentication. That is the single most effective defense against the big crime these days, which is ransomware. All right, because Mm -hmm. what happens is the cyber criminals that are trying to spread ransomware can get a hold of your password in multiple ways. But if they don't have your cell phone to get that extra code or for that second factor is, they're not going to be able to get in and infect your machine. And again, going back to our analogy of kind of physical security and that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. multi-factor authentication is no different than having the normal lock on your door, as well as a deadbolt. Mm -hmm. You have to get past two locks. That's the multi-factor authentication. You have to get through two locks to get into your... So listeners, if you don't get anything else from today's episode, 
make sure you take away that you need to deploy or add multi-factor authentication in all of your accounts that you're able to do so, which should be just about all of them. I know almost every app or something I have, they make you do at least two options to be able to get into your account. Well, they at least offer it. It's something yes. to take advantage of it, right? Yes, we need to take advantage of it. Uh, so, Jim, this has been incredibly insightful conversation. Do you have any final words or advice for our listeners? I think what you're doing, Jarrah, is exactly what people need to hear. And mm -hmm. that, unfortunately, people hear the word cybersecurity and they immediately shut down. And they think, well, this is way complicated. I'm not that smart. I couldn't possibly do this. And so they bury their heads in the sand. And then they also say... Well, I don't have anything worthwhile on my computer, et cetera. I really don't have to worry about this. Mm -hmm. And nothing could be farther from the truth, all right? In fact, you do have valuable things on your electronic devices, and, but also this is not that difficult. You, you can be more secure than you are. Cybersecurity does not have to be complicated, everyone. <laughs> I hope you learned more about cybersecurity and why it's important for us all. Now that we've spilled the tea, it's definitely time to go over the receipts. At the end of each episode of the Tea on Cybersecurity, I will be giving receipts. So what are receipts? When people spill or sip tea, the receipts are the evidence to support the claim that they were talking about. So the Tea on Cybersecurity receipts are evidence that I actually understood what was being discussed with the guests. The receipts are key takeaways that I gathered during the conversation. Number one, we figured out what cybersecurity meant. And I think the easiest analogy is the one that Jim gave us, just thinking about robbers, how robbers are trying to break in and get the goods. That's pretty much what cybersecurity is as well. We have the criminals trying to break into our different devices, trying to get the goods, which is data. Another major thing I took away, another receipt, is that cybersecurity really is everywhere and it affects all of us. It's not just businesses, but it's us as people, as individuals. Cyber criminals can come in and disrupt our entire livelihood just through our cell phones. The craziest, most terrifying thing I learned was about water holing. That's insane. And all of those poor, innocent people that have to deal with that from the website to the people that are tricked and their information is taken. It's crazy and terrifying. So do not get water hold. And the last thing that I took away were that cyber criminals are only getting smarter. By the day we started with one person doing something one time and people are learning from that. And especially the way that technology is changing every day, our cyber criminals are as well. They're able to learn and adapt and sneak into our lives any way that they can. On the next episode, we're going fishing. If you understand cybersecurity, you get the joke. If not, tune in so you can laugh along as well. Thanks for tuning in to the Tea on Cybersecurity. If you like what you listen to, I would be greatly appreciative if you could leave me a review. If you need anything else from me, head on over to Trava Security. Follow wherever you get your podcasts.